Uh, welcome everyone to today's Design and Dialogue. Um, our conversation will be about 45 minutes followed by Q&A, so, which means that you're more than welcome to put down your questions during the conversation into the, into the chat box um, so that we can go through them. Um, we're going to mute everyone to ensure audio clarity. Um, let's turn to Glenn. Hey, thank you, Lucy. Thanks everyone for joining us on this Monday morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you are and whenever you are. It's a great pleasure today to welcome two guests to our show, Alice Story Lichtenstein, who is coming to us from Austria, and Marlene Wiesod, who is not coming to us from Austria, nope. <laughs> although she uh, was an artist in residence at Schloss Hollenegg, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, first, I just want to underline something Lucy said, which is please go ahead and put questions in the chat box as we go along and we'll get to them at the end of the conversation. And also we would really love it if you let us know where you are. So just say hello and where you're listening from. And now Alice, I have to ask you about your wallpaper. <laughs> <laughs> Can you well, tell us what that is you're sitting in front of? I tried to choose a nice background for Michael Lewis who made sure I would choose something nice. So the wallpaper behind me is actually an original Chinese wallpaper from the beginning of the 18th century. Mm. Uh, and it's hand painted on paper. And um, there's actually two full rooms. So I'll just give you a little bit of a, so it's really on all, on all the walls. And in the room next to this one, it's all in pink. So the background is, is pink. And the interesting thing about this wallpaper is that it wasn't made for the European market. It was really made for the Chinese market. Oh. So it's, uh, it, that is in terms of antiques, always a little bit of a difference whether for which market things were made for. But it was installed there in the period. It was installed here probably uh, sometime towards the mid of the 19th century. Gotcha. Okay. And you have a beautiful um, ceramic stove next to you as well that we just saw. Yes. yes. So we'll There's get- one in every room. So we'll get to the wonders of Schloss Hollenegg more in just a moment. Uh, Marlene, can you tell us where you're beaming in from? Hello, I'm at a friend's place right now uh, in my super atelier, my temporary atelier due to lockdown. Um, so yeah, I'm stuck in Paris at the moment, mm. but it's quite nice. We have a garden, so we are lucky. Mm. I like the fact that your two backgrounds could not be more extreme in the historic <laughs> versus modern dichotomy. And that indeed <laughs> is the range of aesthetics that we'll be talking about today. So the, the game plan here, everybody, is that we're first going to hear from Alice about Schloss Hollenegg and its provocative and innovative design program. And then this exhibition called Walden, which is now going to be a digital exhibition because of the virus crisis, of course. Um, and then we'll talk about Marlene's work and also your time there at Schloss Hollenegg mm -hmm. when you were an artist in residence. And then we'll finish up with a discussion of a new commission which I don't think almost anybody will know about yet. So it's going to be a real pleasure to um, preview that and share that news at the end of our conversation. And then we'll have questions. So first, Alice, um, maybe we could start talking about the program that you have um, at Schloss Hollenegg and tell us about the place and your history with it. Um, yes, so the place, as you can see, is a castle. Uh, the first mention is from 1163. So we're approaching the 900 years of history. And this castle has been in my husband's family for almost 200 years. And uh, we moved here uh, six years ago. And at the beginning, I was very against the idea of living in a castle, thought the responsibility was a bit too much. Um, and when we moved, I really thought, okay, well, we need to do something with it because every room is full. Uh, there's just so much history. There's so many uh, beautiful art pieces, applied art pieces. Um, so the idea was to start a designers in residency program. And that's, we started that in 2015. And the way it works is that we invite uh, designers over the summer, they stay between one and two weeks and they work to a given theme. They let themselves be inspired by the rooms, by the history of the place. And uh, the projects that they then develop are produced uh, together, sometimes in corporations with uh, companies, and we present them the following year in a collective exhibition, uh, which is the exhibition that we are about to open this coming Friday. So, for example, Marlene came last summer. She stayed here just over a week. Uh, we worked together on a project 
Uh, the following months, I mentored her and we went into production with the piece and the piece is going to be presented to the public in this kind of uh, collective exhibition where there'll be 20 designers presenting. Not all of them were designers in residence. Um, and, and every year we have an exhibition. So this is actually our fifth, fifth year. Great, okay. Before we get on to uh, Merlin's work and Walden as an exhibition project, let's talk a little bit about some of the past things that you've done there. Um, because you've been extremely active <laughs> since starting this and it's amazing what you're able to achieve in this historic environment, um, which I gather imposes some um, restraints or restrictions on what you can actually do in terms of making exhibitions. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a kind of, uh, there's, there's some advantages and there are some, obviously some real difficulties. So uh, the, the, the interiors are so rich and there's so much history and there are so many beautiful things that obviously the, the design pieces really need to be strong enough uh, to stand out and they need to be really integrated. So that's, that's a, really the most important thing is when, when I select designers, I really try to find designers that can work with the history of the place um, there are some great designers which are not necessarily interested in history and that is always like a, a really difficult one. Um, mm. So that's, that's definitely something which is important is to really work with the rooms and, and take something out of the rooms um, to really create a conversation between the historical and the, and the modern pieces. Um, on the other hand, uh, because it's a private place, we have a lot of freedom. So I can imagine that um, when you're working in a museum, you have certain constraints about you know safety and security and what you're allowed to do which uh, most of the time we can just happily disregard um, and that's always uh, it's there's some great stories with designers that have said oh can we just chop down the tree and they kind of go maybe perhaps and and we kind of go yeah sure or can we make a hole in the wall? And it's like, of course, where, where do you want the hole? You know, <laughs> so there are some things which are just very easy because it's just up to my husband and me to, to decide. Mm. It's um, an interesting we're contrast here. with a place like the Cooper Hewitt, for example, which has a very strong historic character, but then they also have a lot of regulations as to what they can do. And you have a kind of expressive freedom of there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's also part of the history of the castle is um, every generation has added to it. So although it starts in the med medieval times, then we have, you know, Renaissance, Baroque, Neo-Gothic. So you have all the styles mixed in. So mm -hmm. we just felt, well, it's time to bring the design in. <laughs> um, what we see here is a piece by Commonplace Studio. And it's, um, it's a table that actually is divided in two. So it can uh, go down to be a bench. It can be a desk with a table with a bench or be a high table. Mm. So it's a... It's a highly technological piece, which is curved to fit to fit the room, for example. So in a case like this one, obviously the shape of the table is responsive to the contours of the room. So is this yeah. a permanent installation or was this uh, commissioned? And then uh, this was a, this is commissioned. It actually uh, doesn't in theory belong to Schloss Hollenet because it was sponsored by a company, mm. uh, but they have given it on permanent loan to the castle. So it's still there. Yeah. It also reminds me a little bit of uh, Chatsworth, maybe, like the idea of this layered historic environment in which these very vivid contemporary installations are happening. I feel, I feel very flattered you said something like that. I would have <laughs> never dared, but... <laughs> so here we see another one. Yes, this is an installation by Nel Verbeke. So these are um, for niche and inside it there's a table and it's for the tea ceremony. So again, here the architecture of the room really influenced the architecture of this, um, of this installation. And in this room, we have a, a fairly extensive collection of uh, china and teacups. So that was also the theme for her to really discover, you know, how the ceremony of the tea and create a kind of environment where you could sit and, and really take the time and sit with other three people and, and sit at the table. The whole theme of last year exhibition was at the table and conversation mm. at the table. Do you generally try to choose themes that are anchored in some way into the domesticity uh, of the space? The, the um, it, I wouldn't say it's the domesticity of the place, but there definitely have to be themes which are relevant to the castle. Mm. Um, so there, a lot of the themes also have to do with, you know, what I feel I'm living at the moment or where I feel is relevant 
in a, in a wider context, um, but they need to be anchored in the castle in some way. So, for example, Hollenig, um, it's, it was historically a summer place, a summer castle. So it was a place where people were always invited, where dining was a very part, big part of the, of the day, uh, where guests were regularly coming and going. So it felt uh, the, the theme of the table and coming together and communion at the table felt very, very relevant to the place. Hmm. So tell us about this commission from uh, Bureau Belen. Um, this was uh, two years ago. The theme for this um, exhibition um, was, oh God, um, I'm having a moment of, oh, this was legacy. Um, and what they felt, yes, yeah, so the theme about this one was about what is your legacy and what you're leaving behind. And what they were trying to do was trying to create um, some pieces which were like aliens in the room and uh, to create a kind of uh, um, confusion about what was uh, historical and what was new and what was kind mm -hmm. of not really fitting. So this is the kind of round screen and the way that uh, it distorts the light and it distorts the vision uh, of the room. So the idea was to like hide behind it and see everything slightly upside down mm -hmm. or slightly distorted. And that was to like create a different perspective in a historical context. Nice. So th that's an interesting thing too, because um, of course you're dealing with contemporary designers who may have a different value system from the value system of the people who lived in the building. So when you choose a concept like legacy, for example, you're really dealing with this aristocratic history and trajectory. And then you bring in these designers who may not at all align with that way of looking at the world and this kind of distortion feel that they've interposed into the space, I suppose, is a way of addressing that in some sense. I think, I think that's right. But that's what I find it's really interesting is like when you're living in a place like that and you know, you're spending a lot of time just making sure that things are restored and kept and uh, maintaining the place, um, you kind of don't see the potential a lot of the time. I love it when those people come in because suddenly I notice things which I would have never read in that way. And I'm just, you know, I tend to see just the fact that there's a lot of work and a lot of staircases. Mm -hmm. And then people come and see details or interpret, um, you know, a, a piece of art in a, in a very new way. And that's always the, the very exciting, exciting thing about it is, uh, it's what I love most about having people over is, is the way that it allows me to see the place with fresh eyes every time. Yeah, I guess there's um, an interesting, kind of uh, dichotomy here between doing what previous inhabitants of the house had done, which is to say to redecorate it, you could even say, but to, to make it feel like it belongs to the present moment without erasing what was in the past. But then there's a totally different spirit in which these installations work in comparison to, you know, ordering new tapestries in the 17th century or something like that. I, think, I mean, I think nowadays we're very, sometimes we're very, conservative in the way we work with places in a way that past generations have not been like when the Liechtenstein bought this place in um, in 1821 what they did in the following 50 years was uh, embed the whole place with their own history and they added a whole layer of historization uh, which is completely fake so you see things that you think belong to the renaissance and actually they were put in there in the 1850s or 1870s. And the idea was to pretend that Hollening had always been in the, in the Liechtenstein family. Mm -hmm. And if you think of something like that done nowadays, you would think, oh my God, that's so nouveau riche. And so kind of like, uh, I don't know, Kardashian in a way, you know? And, and they felt absolutely comfortable doing it. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that that's, that's something that we're kind of, we've become very conservative about the way that we deal with historical houses and buildings and um yeah. it's like that that conservators motto of first do no harm so everything needs to be reversible all those kinds of things but you're exactly. trying to approach it at the scale of architecture rather than an object yeah which is which is fair enough but i think sometimes one can can be a little bit more brave mm -hmm. in the kind of intervention one does so can you tell us about this uh, particular intervention? It seems to me like it has some thematic connections to Walden actually, but curious to hear. Yeah, about. but it wasn't actually. Um, oh. it fits, it's still there, so it fits very well. Mm. Um, this is a table which was done uh, with the wood of a redwood sequoia. 
uh, which was, uh, had been hit by lightning, so it was already dead. And that's a perfect example. So Brad Eskel of their Austrians, they saw this redwood sequoia, they started, there's actually three of them. So two are still living, one was dead, um, but still standing. And they were very intrigued, why are there redwood sequoias in Austria? It's not the ideal climate, who brought them over? So they started doing all the research and they found out that um, one of the Liechtenstein in 1870 had gone to the States, had done six months of traveling. He was a very good um, diary writer, so he wrote every day what happened. And uh, he came to California, fell in love with the sequoias and brought back the sequoias. Mm. And, and then one night after long talks and drinks, they kind of very timidly asked Alfred if there was perhaps any chance of maybe, you know, felling the tree. And they were pretty sure that they were going to get a no as an answer. And Alfred was like, yeah, when do you want to do it? Kind of thing. <laughs> um, so we actually chose the birthday of Heinrich, who was the Liechtenstein who brought uh, over the tree. Mm. And we felled the tree in a very long uh, kind of elaborate ritual. And this is one of the tables that came out of the, out of the tree. Mm. And um, the idea was to stack the pieces of wood uh, in a very kind of simple way to kind of remind the fact that, you know, the, the family business is timber and uh, to really just have the material as raw as possible. Mm. So you still see its character as planks, really, like it's just exactly. ripped out of the tree. And that's actually the name of the project. Mm. Okay, just a couple more um, installations, if you could tell us about it quickly before we get on to Walden. Yeah, so this is one of the very first. This is a, um, a shelving system that Dean Brown did in the very first year. Mm. And he really tried to work with the room. So it frames the door and the shelves are the same uh, shape as the windows. So although it's extremely uh, modern and clean, um, it's actually uh, very well fitting to the, to the space. And, and really responds to the architectural kind of creates, character. Yeah. yeah, and it creates a kind of like, it's a, small, it's a small museum in the museum. So mm. it's where I can like put new objects and try them out and you know, mm. do small installations. It makes me think about the historical idea of a cabinet of curiosities, which of course Absolutely. is something that happened yeah. a lot in yeah. buildings of that this character. That was definitely one of his inspirations. Yeah. Uh, this is two, um, two lamps by Lex Pot. Uh, this were inspired by the idea of a family tree. And what's interesting about these lights is that um, there's only one LED right at the top. But because of refraction, it looks like the whole thing is kind of light lit up. Mm. But actually, uh, the LED is right, right at the top. And that's, and that's it. Amazing. So technically, they were, they were quite innovative. Yeah, and it, the image is both tree-like, obviously, but also can make you think of nerve systems or some other kind of yes. network. Yeah. Especially when they're lit up in this picture. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of science fiction meets nature. Yeah. Well, the, the interesting thing that room didn't have any electricity, so huh. we decided to put it in, and so it felt it needed to be something quite strong. Hmm. This is a rug by Odd Matter. Um, we had a rug in there, which was in a really bad condition. And Odd Matter decided that for them, legacy was about choosing what you keep and choosing what you're going to let go and choosing what you're going to add. So they decided that the rug had to go, you had to let go because it was so bad. But they kept a part of the pattern, which is mm. the kind of round at the, at the beginning, which kind of informs the whole thing. And then they decided from this pattern, we're going to have a, a, a new rug hmm. develop. So it was a kind of like keeping something from the past, throwing something away and adding something new. Hmm. And again, super well fitted to the room. Yeah. And I think this, this is, is our last previous installation shot. This is by Stephanie Honig. Um, she's an Austrian designer and she worked with Gerozinski and Vauguin, which are silversmiths in Vienna. And um, so she, this room is actually called the winter dining room. And she felt, okay, this is the perfect setting. And she really wanted to experiment with silver. So all her shapes are very much about the refraction and the balance and how do you make very contemporary pieces with such a kind of old fashioned material. Mm. And this was a very, it was a lovely cooperation with, with Jaroszynski. So we're, we, we were all three very happy about how this worked out.
And that firm is super interesting too, because they were really at death's door before a younger generation fellow came along and basically rescued it. You know, yeah, the yeah. No, they, they've done a, they've done a very interesting job of like uh, working with designers on contemporary objects. And at the same time, keeping alive the tradition and mm -hmm. making very classical, uh, very classic design piece, uh, silver pieces. So as we've seen, the program is very international, but do you have a, a part of the project that's about bringing the focus on Austrian designers specifically and give them an international stage? Is that part of what's in your um, uh, I, objectives? Yeah, I try not to like be too rigid about it, um, but we definitely have every year at least uh, a few designers which are Austrians. And I always try to have one uh, designer in residence from Austria. So we have supported Austrian designers a lot and we try to work also with Austrian companies when possible. So it's, um, yes, it's definitely there. It's not coded in any way because I feel it's, it's, that makes it too rigid. So some, some years it's more and some years might be a little bit less. Hmm. But we do really try to work with, with, um, with local designers and, and at the same time with the international ones. Great, okay. Let's talk about Walden now. I guess the first thing to say is that the word is quite interesting because for an American audience, of course, it suggests Henry David Thoreau's famous book. Um, but in German, it could have a slightly different meaning, which I think is really interesting. Yeah, well, in German, the reason why I chose it is, of course, because of Thoreau's book, but also Wald uh, means forest in German. And if you add the E-N, it's kind of the verb for forest. So it doesn't mean anything, but it has this association about foresting or wilding. Mm. Um, so it felt like it's a good word because you can pronounce it both in English or in German. and and it has different kind of connotations, which at some point meet together. Mm. Um, so it felt like a, a good a good umbrella for the theme. Mm. And can you say a little bit about what the um, overall ethos of the project is? Um, so I felt it was very important to keep talking about uh, the environmental crisis and ecology. So that was definitely the starting point. And um, there has there have been some very interesting uh, groundbreaking design exhibitions. Uh, in the last few years, and I felt, okay, we need to keep this conversation going. It's important to add to it and different points of views. But at the same time, I felt I didn't want to talk about, you know, the very kind of guilt-inducing, uh, I didn't want to have a guilt-inducing narrative. I felt we needed, especially considering the place, we needed to have a more uh, mm, positive uh, way of approaching the subject. And also I looked at the castle and I felt, well, the castle is something extremely man-made, extremely artificial, but in some idyllic way, it manages to fit in the countryside and it fits in nature. So you, you are constantly fighting nature in the summer because there's plants growing in and animals coming in and insects. And I felt, well, this is the right combination. So how do you bring a bit of wilderness in everyday life? And how do you combine this natural and artificial technological and environment, the countryside and the city, um, without having to choose one or the other. And, mm. and also was a, it's very much the, the brief I gave the designers was bring a bit of wilderness and let's embrace the, the wild side, the dirty side, the uncomfortable side. Um, I think we have to stop thinking of nature as something idyllic, postcard. Um, you know, and I think right now we are seeing that. I mean, you know, our world has come to a standstill because of a tiny virus. I mean, mm. that's, that just shows the fact that we just have to accept that we are not mastering everything and, and we're just a very tiny part of the whole ecosystem. Yeah, we're not as in charge as we think so we are. So that was a little bit the, the, mm. the theme in a nutshell. Mm. Can you say a little bit about some of the projects that um, you've curated into the show, like this one, which doesn't at first look that wild? <laughs> no, this doesn't look wild at all because, again, it's a kind of very technological, very clean aesthetic. But actually, it's a lamp that you need to charge with a crank. Mm. So you have to turn around the crank. And um, the idea was to really kind of make people visualize how much energy you need uh, for electricity. So it's the ratio is very clear. For two minutes of cranking, you get one minute of electricity. Mm. Uh, the, the nice touch is that you can actually remove, you can leave the base and you can remove the lamp. 
so that you can walk around the castle as if it was a kind of modern day torch uh, or uh, candle. Uh, so that's a kind of the, the more uh, fun aspect of it. But we really wanted to have something that makes you realize how much energy you need to use, uh, mm. you know, just to have a little bit of light. So it really brings the uh, yeah. idea of resources and up to exactly. the fore. Yeah. Um, sorry, that, the project that we just saw is by Clemens Schillinger, who's actually an Austrian designer, and he was designing residence. This is a project by Marianne Drews. She's German. Uh, she just graduated from Design Academy, so this is a graduation project. And it's a research about um, soils and um, different properties of soils and the fact that soils are getting impoverished. And she has dusted up um, um, a laboratory technique, which is called chromotherapy, um, by which you do a kind of a picture of the soil and you see what kind of um, components it has, what kind of uh, things it lacks, what kind of nutrients it needs. And, and the idea is then to combine different soils to revitalize them. And what she wants to do is bring this kind of very old fashioned technique back to communities so that communities can be in charge of their own soils rather than, you know, large corporations having all the know how and small uh, farmers uh, not having a clue about the nutrients in their soil or having to send their soil to laboratories to mm. find out what their soil is actually like. So um, it's about transparency with regard. Yeah, it's very much about transparency, community building. Um, so we actually had planned, for example, a workshop uh, inviting farmers, which are our neighbors, to try out the system. We're not going to be able to do that, of course, but that was a kind of um, idea behind this project. Mm -hmm. um, here we have, again, uh, a different lamp by Clemens. So this is actually embedded in the table, and this works with pedals. And in front, we have uh, a small stool by uh, Destroyers Builders. And this is a very, it's a very simple object. It looks like, you know, just two pieces of rock or two pieces of, uh, three pieces of rock kind of balanced together. And, mm -hmm. and that's also kind of a part of this very simple aesthetic of doing things with what you have around yourself. Yeah, like a historical dolmen that you might see out in yeah. Scotland, right? At, at <laughs> Neolithic. <laughs> um, this is a project by Crafting Plastics. Uh, they're from Bratislava and um, they were also designers in residence. They have created this screen, which is actually going into a window here in Hollenegg. And this is made out of a material which is called Nuatan, uh, which is um, a copyrighted material. It's uh, a bioplastic. So it's actually not plastic at all. It's 100% uh, biodegradable material but it is extremely durable and it has the same kind of uh, properties that plastic might have. So you can, you know, uh, work it, mold it, heat it, um, and it has a kind of transparency to it. So the idea is for this window to be closed. It's an archway actually, and it's closed with this um, frame. So you can really play with the light and reveal some of the nature behind it or hide it, uh, protect yourself from wind or rain, or just open it all up. Hmm. It's a really strong connection to Marlene's work, but um, we have just a couple of more installation shots of Walden first. So this is, um, oh. this is by Studio Tut. They are two Austrian uh, ladies working in Vienna. Uh, this, is a, this is a more didactic uh, project. So this is all about the fly. And the idea was to show that even a very annoying insect like flies actually has a role in the ecosystem. So these are the kind of installations that we, uh, the project that we do more for our schools. Uh, we have a lot of students that usually come. So mm. this is all about the, uh, you know, what a fly can do and how it can be useful and why it's important uh, to even keep the fly in our ecosystem. Mm. But also a very beautifully designed object in a beautiful yes. space, yeah. Um, this is, I have to say, this is one of my favorites. <laughs> uh, this is a, a, a dry toilet. And um, so again, it's this idea of like uh, reusing what we waste and how can you, you know, use our waste for fertilizers or for compost. And the way it's designed, first of all, it's all 3D printed and it's 3D printed with biodegradable materials. 
and the shape is inspired by a Romanesque column. Um, and Romanesque columns always had the capital with like stories engraved in it and mythological animals uh, symbolizing something. So what they've done here is um, they've actually told the whole story about waste and the and water and how water uh, you know goes through the sea and the mountains and all the rest of it. So it's a it's completely um, random kind of object which is kind of very low tech and then extremely high tech because it's got this kind of 3d printed uh technology behind it mm. and is it actually sitting there permanently for the show no. <laughs> <laughs> that looks like that. <laughs> precarious I love, I love the way that the photographers have done have done the pictures so we're putting together a catalog where all the objects have been photographed in a kind of random setting uh, most uh, of them uh, have actually been photographed in the woods and in the castle around and this is like kind of moving from the rooms to the outside. So it's kind of part of the, of the walk as we move through the castle into the countryside. Gotcha. Well, it's great there will be a catalog um, as well as the online yes. means of access to the show because of yeah. course very few people will get to actually see it in person as it turns out. Uh, this is um, a project just tell us about, one last project. Yeah. yeah, this is a project by Misha Traxler. Uh, it's part of their real limited um, series. So um, these uh, grass uh, elements, they are actually made out of copper. And uh, this grass, uh, there's only 200 uh, specimens left in Austria. So in this table, there's 40 of them and there'll be five tables each with 40 of them. So the idea is to visualize something which, you know, if you say there's only 200 of them, you just, you know, it's hard with numbers sometimes to really get a picture of it. And this is really to show you how many of these specimens are left. And mm. this is actually then a table. So you're bringing a bit of nature into your living room. I really like this element of the show where you're trying to clarify people to people what's happening already, like the soil samples, for example, or the cranking of the lamp to give people a sense of what's actually at stake and the relationship that they have to the environment. Yeah. And, I, um, yeah, maybe this is- the important part is like, you, you know, sometimes you really have to like uh, show in a very kind of tangible way what things are like, you know, it's one thing to be telling people and reading about it. But I think if you have a, a visual help, uh, it brings it much more home. And, and as I said, we do have a lot of uh, schools and we have a lot of uh, people who are not really used to design exhibitions. Um, so it's for them uh, to get a bit of a story behind it. It's always the most interesting aspect of the exhibition. Mm, great. Well, thank you for that virtual tour. That was fantastic to see. And some of these themes, of course, are very important in Marlene's work. So it serves as a very neat segue to uh, the bio design that you do. Um, but before we get on to your objects and projects, you have this absolutely wonderful image of you and your <laughs> father, uh, which says a lot about why you do what you do. So perhaps you could start the story there for us, Marlene. Yes, sure. Bonjour. Um, I'm super happy to see people actually in this weird time. Um, so yeah, in this picture, you have uh, Pierre Luisou uh, with my father and me. Um, I was a very um, cute girl <laughs> with a beautiful haircut <laughs> made by my mother. So I <laughs> grew up in the, in the French Alps um, with a family of big people. So we were in between the French Alps and the center of France uh, where my dad was like traveling with uh, beehives. So I've been uh, very lucky since I'm a kid to, to be able to enjoy nature and be surrounded by it. So it's really part of who I am and, and what I do now. And um, so I studied fine art and uh, textile and uh, nursing school as well. And then everything I think started when I moved to London uh, for a master called Material Future at St. Francis and Martins. It's where everything kind of opened his, um, his arms to me regarding like uh, sustainability and bio design with one, uh, one person called Carol Collet who was the founder of uh, Master. So everything kind of started in London. I had this kind of nature love since I'm a kid, of course, but uh, I think I opened everything in London and started my research uh, doing the project from insects. Mm -hmm. um, which is like a study of uh, materials from honeybee and silkworms. 
So it was basically an experimental kitchen during um, many years and still going on actually because I'm an insect uh, lover. Um, so it was a big kitchen of like looking at matter from the insect world and how we could uh, not uh, mostly implant them into industrial, but more using them as a tool to communicate and engage people to the bio design community. So I, I see all those pieces as a um, as statement, if you want. So some people will call them uh, vase or vessels, but other people will see them as a sculpture. So for me, it's more important to have um, work out there who gives a strong message to people um, and then experiment as much as you can with it. So that is a very strong connection to what Alice was saying, because um, in some sense, this is speculative design. It's not that you're actually proposing that people remake their environment using bio no, resins no, no. from insects. No. It's to give people a sense. And every day I have uh, people asking like, how, do, how can we industrialize it? Uh, this is not a message at all. I mean, all this first work was really to show the potential and the beauty of the uh, insect world and mm -hmm. how they are important to us. Um, and now I'm directing myself more into how can we actually really coexist with other species and how can we um, implant and welcome them back to our cities and our daily life. Hmm. So we'll get to that in a minute. Um, yeah. But first, we, we should look at the way that you developed the vocabulary around mm -hmm. these insect-based materials. And I'm, I'm curious if you could also talk a little bit more about what you're actually doing to get this black chitinous reflective material yeah. like wh so, what is it in, yeah in, so the the honeybee oh i didn't i can't hear you can you repeat oh you're back now yeah, yes my internet <laughs> is uh, <yeah. laughs> so the the honeybee resin come from trees so the bees they will collect it from uh different forests so the color will really depend where they go to pick it up and uh, when you collect it, so it's a matter you can only collect once a year, that's why it's like very precious and, uh, and important. You collect it when you collect the honey. So when you, when you have it, it's a mix of like pollen, resin, and all sorts of different components. So we need to clean the material by boiling everything into hot water. Um, and, and then you will separate with a little spoon all the different components. So it's very like a uh, labor, laboring uh, process. Um, and as soon as you've done the cleaning part, you have this raw material, which is the resin, but you can actually do a lot of things with it. Me, I decided to uh, work with it uh, with glass techniques because it was very similar to glass. So I've done all sorts of uh, glass experiments, going from glass blowing to Venetian techniques to engraving techniques. So uh, this piece, for example, has a lot of engraving techniques. But we, we actually blown the material as the glass, but 10 times lower uh, than glass because it's a bee resin. Um, so it was really a way to push the material and try to challenge it in a different way uh, to show like the potential of it. And so then this is a, another application of some of the same um, techniques that you've developed and using the materiality of the cocoon. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so that was back in uh, 2017. Uh, so with the silkworm cocoon, I've been developing uh, a material which is called the wooden lever. Um, but this project is only about the cocoons themselves. So it's really a project to celebrate the life of the insects because as you know, in maybe or not, uh, in the silk industry, normally the, co like the worm is boiled alive in the cocoon. Um, and those cocoons were the one I was using for the wooden lever back then in my studies at St. Martin's. Uh, but then I, I discovered uh, the peace silk movement, which is actually a movement that is not killing the worm inside the cocoon, but it's uh, letting the worm becoming a butterfly. So it's letting the, the worm at maturation, if you want. Mm. So all the species from the cocoon collection are a way to celebrate the, the life of the insects and the importance of, uh, of their presence in our life. Uh, so that was a commission from the Victoria and Albert Museum. It was the first piece of the collection. Are you actually? Yeah. Okay. Ask, are the cocoons actually still present in these objects or are they you casting the cocoons? No, the cocoons are purely in the metal. So in the previous one, for example, on the bench, 
uh, you don't have any wooden structure. So it's a bench which is around uh, like, let's say three kilograms. So you can actually sit wow. on it, but it's, I mean, as you know, I'm not really a, a product designer. So you can sit on it if you want, but it's not a very functional object. <laughs> But the ones after, so the wardrobe. Super light for tonight. Yeah. So it's basically only cocoons with honeybee resin on top. As the material is very precious, I was looking at a way to use less material. And um, so, for example, on this wardrobe, we use the same quantity as the, as the vase you saw before. Mm, amazing. This is, I think, the most functional one. So it's a kind <laughs> of a wardrobe. <laughs> It's interesting though how it creates its own aesthetic because it's it's like you are co-designing with the insects, so it's partly yeah, yeah. them. Yeah. And I mean, I'm not really sketching or drawing or making any models before going into the work. Uh, the material is really guiding uh, me when I make the piece. You know, mm. um, it's quite a, it's quite it's it's a natural process here. It's very spontaneous. Mm. Here we see a process shot. Yeah. So that was another way to celebrate the, the life of the insects. I basically took like uh, cocoons that were left over from the mutation of the butterfly. And then I put um, metal inside to really have this kind of random uh, kind of process, letting the, the metal fuse into the, the cocoons and burn it to kind of encapsulate uh, the, the the beauty of the natural world so it's a it's it's a piece that will really stay on time and it's one of the only time i used metal uh, in my work because normally i only work with natural materials so it was very intriguing for me to do that um but i was really happy to kind of see metal as a way to freeze uh the life of the insects mm. and to celebrate that into the piece like a three-dimensional photograph of sorts exactly yeah I love this image too because of the fact that it's sitting on bubble wrap and you get the juxtaposition yeah. of this mass produced yeah. materiality with the very artisanal biodesign materiality. Yeah. Very, similar. very artisanal. Yeah, yes. And <laughs> here's is, the I think it's, yeah, it's 110 uh, kilograms, I think, and it's something we've done in London outside of the studio going to a uh, to a, to, a, to a kitchen to cook the metal ourselves. And it was very, uh, very crazy. Mm. Yeah, so this is a chair or, I mean, you can sit on it as well, but you, you don't have to. Um, I, what I liked about this work is this ambiguity between uh, functional and non-functional. Mm. Um, what is it? I, I don't really know. It's like, if you ask me to define myself as well, I don't really know what I am. Like if I'm an artist or a designer, I always like, like this ambiguity about uh, letting the doors open to many possibilities um, mm. because I think it's super important for artists and designers uh, to actually not work alone in the studio nowadays, but just to go out and collaborate with as many people as possible. Mm. So in our, like in our studio, we work every day with scientists, with uh, craftsmen, uh, with farmers, you know, and it's, I think you, if you have to say something, you need all those expertise to, to be able to get to have a message out there. And the object is sort of equally um, an experiment and an artwork, and it's also yeah, kind of grown and so. kind of made. So mm -hmm. it crosses all but these I mean, problems. when we started this piece, we had no idea that it was well, like, what would be the end result. You know, it's this kind of a very random process, which is letting like failures and uh, happy accident, I like to call them, in, uh, in the making, which is sometimes very good and sometimes not at all, but uh, for that one, it was a good, good accident. Let's look at this more recent group of um, objects, which have this fascinating function of being residential mm. yeah. <laughs> homes for insects. Yeah, so uh, this project started with a collaboration with uh, Jane Weaver Studio in London for the London Design Festival last year. Um, and it came to my mind that a lot of people ask me, like in Milan and, and Miami, like, when are you going to do your first chair, Marlene? And I was like, oh, I don't really want to design a chair. And, and I was like, actually, yes, I want to design a chair. And uh, I want this chair not to be for humans, uh, but for insects. So I called this project, Please Stand By. Uh, and it's a series of like uh, two chairs and more like sculptural pieces. 
which are completely uh, biodegradable, only made with natural material, which was a crazy kitchen for a month of research to be able to make a piece which will stand outside in the gardens in front of the v &A. Um, and all the holes you see actually are refuges for insects. So mm. they are in between 10 to 12 centimeters uh, deep. And the insect can go and nest and, uh, and find a refuge within the cities. Um, so now my, my, my dream will be to make buildings in cities like that to mm. welcome back uh, the insects um, in our life. I think it's very important. And have insects had a chance to actually settle into any of these objects yeah, yet? So, yeah, yeah, so that was a bit uh, a shame is that um, the pieces couldn't stay longer than the festival. Um, uh. But we worked with scientists uh, from Kids College that came to analyze uh, who was around and there was some larvas in the, in the piece that we brought back to Paris. Mm. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's actually very working at least... Uh, which is super exciting. Um, but uh, it's, it, for me, it's very important to orient my work now, uh, uh, maybe to design more for insects than for humans, you know, uh, and to make for them uh, so they are comfortable at home. Uh, You'd be glad to know I have a friend in England who's um, using the coronavirus time to make an exhibition for his own chickens. So. Oh, nice. <laughs> um, wow. Okay. And before we get to the um, commission for Walden, can you tell us about this project? Yeah, sure. So that was, um, so as you see, I like to make bigger things now. Um, so this was a project we developed at uh, Domaine de Bois Boucher. I don't know if you're familiar with this place, but it's uh, an amazing place in, uh, in Poitiers. Um, it's a place for workshops from architects, designers, and artists coming every summer. And they invite people from all around the world to take part in this workshop. So I decided to, uh, to do a workshop called Please Slow Down, which is a very good title for now as well for today. Please yeah. slow down, people. Uh, so I was just inviting the people from the workshop to take matters uh, around the domain, only natural materials to kind of build this architecture that is... Um, a kind of meditate, meditation place uh, to take back to, to rethink our way we connect with nature. Uh, so it was a very challenging kind of uh, workshop of like only four days. So we were 10 people building this four meter tall uh, cocoon in the, in the forest. Um, so, and I think really challenging for people coming from the more industrial path to just make with natural materials and to make something that can stand at the end and really become an habitat uh, within nature. So they really have to adapt their skill set to yeah, get yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. a lot of people said like they wanted to get their hands dirty. So I think they, <laughs> they, they were dirty. They certainly did. It's fascinating <laughs> because museums are so often determined to keep insect life out and you it makes you realize how artificial an environment mm. um one is creating and at least i know that you said earlier that um at holland egg you actually have to tolerate the fact that they're insects because there have been for centuries and it's not going away anytime soon yeah. um but there's the finished cocoon um yeah. but let's talk about the the commission that marlene has done for uh holland egg with the um uh, carbon manufacturer say say tapis um, and this is really being uh, premiered here and now. So I don't know that anybody will have seen it. Yet. And this, this really connects to the residency that you did last year, Marlene. So yes. wondering how you, how you reacted to the space at Hollenegg. But, alors, um, I have to say that now I live in a city, but I'm a very nature person. Uh, and actually I'm, I'm buying a farm now, so I'm moving everything to the countryside. Uh, so going to Alice was kind of a first step for me was to be like, okay, is it the right time for me to move to a farm or not? Because I know how isolated she is there. And um, so, I mean, it was amazing. I spent seven days, even more, I think, eight days. Um, I had an entire ale of the castle for me just to experiment and uh, and uh, draw, actually, because the, the main uh, process of the, of the collaboration was drawing. Um, it was really meditative uh, moments. Like I was a little princess. <laughs> <That> <laughs> was... 
a little bit. But uh, no, it was um, it was super nice to have a break. You know, when you uh, when you work, uh, when you have your studio, you have uh, assistants, you have a lot of things going on, and uh, it was uh, I think the first time since I created the studio that I was just alone with Alici and our family and be able to take a lot of like inspiration from the place uh, of the castle. So it was, it was a luxury for me to be there. Hmm. And so this is, I, I guess you're talking to one of the representatives of the yeah. company, is that right? Exactly, yeah. So, um, I mean, the first uh, thing I think that really uh, um, embraced me when I arrived at the castle was uh, the nature coming back to the castle like how nature was invading actually the castle and like in my bedroom for example we are like there was a lot of flies and like there was like the biggest insect I never saw in my life I think in <laughs> uh, and and I always like this uh, because all my objects are not really representing insects themselves like they are representing materials or like existence for uh, insects but um, but I wanted to kind of um, mimic this uh, swarming effect of the insects in mm. the in the castle of Aniche and how people are very scared of insects uh, mostly and how it's important to bring them back into our daily life. Uh, so I I did these really tiny tiny drawings uh, of like swarming effects uh, simulating the insects. Mm. And Alice, can you take over the story now and talk about the actual production of the carpet? Um, so yes, yeah, so this collaboration um, started more or less at the same time with Marlene. So I knew I wanted to have Marlene as design in residence and, and I'd been talking to Cecita P and they were very keen to, to do something together. So we kind of like, I managed to do this uh, matchmaking, which was incredibly positive uh, for it was worked out really well. So one of the things that Marlene uh, decided right from the beginning was that she, she really wanted this rug to be as ecological as possible. So I think one thing which is really important to say is that although the rug has, I think, between six and eight different colors, um, every single, uh, all the wool used is not dyed. So that it's all natural colors of the wool. Mm. And, and of course, she didn't want to work with silk because of the, what she explained before. And and CCTP were super happy to um, you know to go into this direction, and what came out the rug that came out um, is actually going in production, so it will be in their catalog, and and that feels um, a real success I think for everyone involved because a lot of the projects that we do here are more experimental, they're more about you know testing the limits, uh, telling a story, but when you manage when you manage to have you know something which is experimental and it's telling a story and fits the exhibition and it goes into production it feels like okay bingo we've done it yeah it's something design can do that um you know pure fine art can't do is have that additional story or additional trajectory so is this the prototype the first prototype that we're looking at here so this is the first prototype what i love is that this is not actually a drawing by madeleine this is actually the picture of the rug but if you see it like this you think this is actually the drawing. So I think you need yeah. to skip to the next slide uh, yeah. where you see it on the side and you kind of get, now you can see, okay, this is, might be a rug. Um, and I think what they've done is amazing because they've really transformed uh, very faithfully Marlene's drawing mm. into uh, you know, a, a beautiful rug, which is comfortable mm. and soft and, and all the rest of it. Yeah. And you have one at Holland Egg now, is that right? So now I have one here in Holland, which is uh, which is part of the exhibition. So uh, it'll be part of the virtual tour and um, the 3D tour and all the rest of it. And Marlene, you haven't actually seen it. No, 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 I haven't. <laughs> but <laughs> what terrible. I wanted to say uh, yeah. about this collaboration, I think that was very interesting. It's that I always refused uh, working with the industry before because I never really wanted to have um, mm. something produced like in editions and series because I, I do mostly unique pieces. Um, but actually this project really changed my, uh, my mind about it because I realized that actually as designer and artist, you can guide the industry to adapt a bit their way of producing and change little, little step-by-step -step things into their mind, which is very interesting, I think. Hmm. 
great. Can you just say that last bit? Because we lost you for a second. The, oh, the no. um, opportunity to work with the manufacturer. Pa Paris so you said is you had you had doing that. Yeah, I think it's, it was very interesting to be able to, uh, as a designer and artist, to kind of guide a bit the industry to change their way of producing. I feel like Zoom is returning us to a state of nature here. So this is uh, the slow down <laughs> effect in, in slow action. Down. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You don't hear me. Well, let's, um, yeah, let's go to the first question. And, and you'll be back in a second when Zoom uh, feels like it <laughs> has its mind of its own. Um, Josh Franco had a question for us about the archiving practices at Slash Solenig. So Alice, I wonder if you could talk about that. Uh, that I read that and I was actually really interested about that question. Um, so we don't, we have, what we do is we always produce a catalog and we try and have a catalog which is uh, as complete as possible. So we'll have all the all the, pro all the projects photographed will have pictures of the installations and how the exhibition looked like. Uh, we don't actually archive ourselves what the designers do, um, although I do have obviously a lot of pictures and uh, information. So the archive we have is more general to the exhibition. Uh, the single projects then, the copyright belongs to the designers. Uh, so that's obviously part of their own personal archive. I think, I hope mm -hmm. that answers the question. Yeah, it does. I think it's it's going to be more important in the case of Walden than some of the other projects because it really only exists as an archived project. Yes, yes. I think, so what we've done for Walden, for example, is uh, we are going to be having the catalog um, as every year and that's printed and it's nice and it's paper and it's always the same format. Uh, what we've done uh, is also we're going to be um, we've done 3D mapping of the rooms where the exhibition is taking place. So for the duration of the exhibition, people can go on our website and really move around the rooms and it's done. I mean, I saw the final thing yesterday evening and I was, oh my God, technology, <laughs> amazing. Um, and we've also done a short film. So there'll be like uh, a short film of about five minutes uh, going through the exhibition and showing all, all the projects. So we've tried to really uh, go from you know the more analog analog printed to the extremely digital and geeky. And we had a question from Marion just now um, as to who was the uh, actual collaborator for the carpet, and they're called CC Tapi. But I wonder if you could tell me uh, or tell us a little bit more about them as a company. Uh, it's a, it's an Italian company and uh, Italian French company actually. They're based in Italy, and uh, they produce everything in Nepal. So they have their own their own production in Nepal, and uh, all the rugs are made to order. And um, I have to say, I was I was incredibly impressed by the company also because they really have a, a very strong uh, ethical approach as well. So they have like a school mm -hmm. for uh, their employees. Uh, in Nepal, so they, they're also really concerned about, you know, giving back to the community there. So that was also something that with Malen, we were like, oh, we really need to go and visit and see uh, what it's like over there. And Marlen, do you think that having had this experience that you might work more with manufacturers to try to go into production? Slowly. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> Maybe possible, um, but um, yeah, it really depends on the project and how I see, like, the, I think it's a lot about the connection, like, uh, and with this step, it was a really good connection because we were really happy to learn about different way of producing. And I was really happy to know how they were producing as well. Um, so yeah, it depends with who, but um, slowly. Yeah. Well, slowly is the watchword of our conversation today. Yes. <laughs> um, but we actually did get through a lot of material there, a lot of images, and it's just fantastic to see how much and invention you have been bringing to your respective sides of design. So, Alison, Marlon, thank you so much for being with us today. It was in a dialogue. I did thank you. To let folks know that uh, this Wednesday we have a very exciting guest with us, Oki Sato from the Japanese design firm Nendo will be with us. And then on Friday, we have with us Sarah Schleining from the Dallas Museum of Art. Nice.
Oh, oh. Up, like, but thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. I see a lot of faces. I know. Yeah, it's wonderful. Thank you so Hello, much. Everybody. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you.